If you've never touched Blender or VFX before, then this is a tutorial for you. Over the course of the next hour or so, you will be able to make a realistic visual effects shot that will fool anyone. So sit down, relax, and let's learn a new skill. Like always, if you want to work along with me, I have everything I use down below. Now since for this tutorial, I'm going to assume that you don't have any experience inside of Blender or visual effects, I'm going to try to explain everything as I can, but of course if you do run into any trouble, make sure to leave a comment down below and I'll try to get to you as fast as I can. If not, you can also look on Google and see if anybody else is running into a similar issue. So first thing we need to do is we need to go ahead and render our movie sequence into a image sequence and that is uh, because of two reasons. The first reason is because we don't want to be tied down by frame rate. If we have it as individual files then we don't really care about the frame rate and we can export the final frame rate at the very end. The second reason is that it's the most compatible between software because sometimes the codec of videos get a little bit funky if you're trying to transfer files from Blender to let's say DaVinci or After Effects. So in order to do that let's come up to here 2 plus to video editing video editing this is just a new workspace that's catered towards this let's go ahead and add our movie okay so let's select our movie here add movie strip and then down here we can actually set the start and end keyframe i'm going to set my end keyframe to 87 uh, just because we have some uh, bicyclists that kind of come where i want the statue to be so i don't want to have to deal with this for this beginner tutorial of course you can set your own range now a couple of things blender automatically set up in the video editing workspace is that it automatically detected the frame rate of our footage it hasn't detected our resolution and so if you wanted to kind of you know save the uh, correct resolution i believe this footage is 4k or or something like that you would have to manually put that in here i'm just going to stick on 1080 for this tutorial and then the other thing uh without getting too complicated into it in this color management section the uh, view transform is on standard and all you need to know for now is that standard is the best view transform for videos and image sequences you'll see what i mean in a little bit so anyways let's go ahead and save out our image sequence so uh, i'm going to go to output output properties and let's save a new file location Okay, so once you found your folder, let's go ahead and create a new folder just so all the image sequences are in that. And then I'm just going to name this folder whatever you want. Uh, and then when you have that, let's double click inside of here. Again, just name it whatever you want to kind of name that. And at the very end, make sure you put a underscore just so our main text of our uh, file name is actually separated from the actual text and string out of our frame uh, number. And so once you have that, let's go ahead and hit accept. You can, of course, select whatever file format you want. I'm going to be sticking with PNG. Uh, I'm going to work with RGB uh, since the, I don't need any alpha for this. And then the color depth and the compression you can play around with. I believe for PNG, it's actually a lossless compression. So it really depends on how long you want this to render. I'm just going to leave it on a 15% uh, compression ratio. And then once we have all of that set up, we can go up here and render and render animation. Okay, so once that has finished, you should get a folder that looks similar to mine where you have uh, basically each frame of your video rendered as an individual uh, image file. And so that is looking good. You can see that our final frame is 87 like we had set before. So you should have something like that. Now let's actually open up a new uh, file inside Blender so we can start completely from scratch again. Uh, I'm not going to save this since we don't need that project anymore. And now we are in the general file inside Blender. And so the first thing that I want to tackle is uh, to actually camera track our footage and so that might sound really daunting and not a lot of beginner tutorials actually go over it but trust me when i say it's not bad at all so let's go ahead and get started in that uh, so i'm going to come up here again we're going to open up a new kind of you know custom workspace we're going to go to plus vfx and motion tracking this is the default kind of motion tracking workspace uh, i'm just going to pull this little uh, menu up and this one down uh, just because we want to deal with uh, the actual main window for now uh, these other windows will come into play in a little bit so first thing we need to do is open up the image sequence that we just made so let's go uh, locate that Here's my image sequence. I'm going to go ahead and hit A to select all of my frames and then open the clip. And now you can see that we basically have uh, this kind of, you know, footage in our scene. It's a little bit choppy playback. And so what we can actually do, first of all, is come up here to the tracking settings right here. We're going to set the scene frames and then prefetch our footage. And so now you can see this blue bar down here is completely blue. And all that's done is basically baked it into our cache. Uh, so now we have super smooth playback and everything looks super nice. Now might be a good time to save your project, so Control-S, and I'm going to save that to a new location. 
Okay, so like Blender automatically did before, it automatically set our view transform. Since we went to a different workspace in the motion tracking work workspace, it actually didn't automatically update our color transform to this. Like I had said before, any image sequence or movie video actually works best in the sta standard uh, view transform. And so we need to go ahead and manually set that. So let's come up to render and then go down to color management and it's uh, automatically set to filmic. AGX is actually a new thing with Blender 4.0. Point oh. uh, so we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, let's select standard and now you can see our colors are way more vi vibrant and actually uh, match to our original plate. And so now uh, to actually motion, motion track, if you want to get kind of more in depth, I actually have a full dedicated tutorial on this, but I'll kind of work uh, work along with you guys and kind of, you know, show you how to motion track this specific scene. First thing I want to go ahead and set is our focal length. Now, uh, I guesstimated the focal length to be about an 18. If you're actually shooting your own footage, you do want to write down your own focal length. But I actually took this into a separate program and was able to calculate kind of a basic uh, focal length that it's uh, close to. And so what I want to do is I want to come over here to the track settings over here if you don't see this menu if you just hit in it'll kind of pop up over here and so uh whenever you're doing what camera tracking you do want to kind of have uh, some of the camera data in front of you it's not a huge deal blender can out, uh, automatically detect it uh, sometimes when we're uh, doing the camera track but it's always just a good rule of thumb to kind of go over here and give it kind of a base kind of number to work with so if you go to camera and then lens, my focal length uh, it gave me in the program was uh, 18. So you just want to put that there. Um, so that should remain constant uh, because we're not zooming in in this shot at all. And so now we want to go ahead and uh, let Blender detect some features in our camera track. Uh, now, when camera tracking, it's going to try to pick up areas of high contrast. Uh, and so, like, if I zoom in here, you'll notice that some of these build uh, uh, kind of windows back here are actually pretty high contrast. And it's going to be easy for the program to kind of, you know, automatically detect those. Let's go ahead and delete those. Uh, again, I am hitting control and clicking just to kind of, you know, make those markers. But again, I'm not going to really manually do that. I want Blender to do as much work for me as possible. And so let's come back out here. You'll notice all these settings on the side. Uh, without getting too into it again, uh, you can, you know, change all these settings. I have uh, the full dedicated camera tracking tutorial. If you are interested, I break down each setting uh, bit by bit so you can get a better camera track. But for this scene, we're just going to keep it super simple. We're going to leave the pattern size and the search size on its default values the uh, match we're going to set to previous frame and then we're going to also normalize the footage now previous frame i just find uh, works a little bit better in trying to track the markers automatically and then normalize basically takes a luminance uh, value change of all the pixels and make sure that they're kind of level all throughout the uh, video basically that means that if there's any luminous changes like exposure or anything it's not going to throw off the tracker and so it's always just a good uh, kind of rule of thumb to keep that on finally over here I just like to set up the tracking settings extra. I want to set the correlation to a 0.9. That basically just means that Blender has to be 90% sure that the tracking marker is correct in the correct location for it to actually continue tracking the marker. And if not, it'll actually stop tracking at that point, which uh, will give us a better camera track. And so now that we have all of this set up, again, I do want uh, kind of Blender to do its own thing. So I'm going to come up here to detect features. You can see that we have uh, now uh, Blender is automatically detecting some of the high contrast features of the video that it thinks is going to be the best track. We do have a couple of problems. So first of all, we don't have as many markers in our scene. And second of all, we have some markers that are kind of clinging on to this black little border down here. And so I don't want, uh, you know, markers to be affected by that black border. So first of all, I'm going to come and uh, reveal this kind of uh, menu down here, the detect features menu. We can see this margin. I just want to increase that margin. And all that is going to do is that's basically just going to say, uh, hey, don't, you know, don't put trackers uh, 72 pixels away from the border of my footage. And so if we just increase that, you can see that it's basically 72 pixels uh, kind of border down here that it's not going to select a tracker. So we have a little bit room of error right there. Second, we want to go ahead and change down the threshold. This is basically what Blender automatically kind of, you know, calculates to, uh, you know, select those good trackers, like I said before. The idea that we're going to do is that we're going to have as many tracking markers as we can possibly track in the scene and then uh, little by little we're gonna kind of delete those and whittle it down so that we get a good camera track and only get the uh, good markers in our scene and then finally the distance i want to put to an 80 again this is just kind of giving us more markers in the scene 
And so now that we have all of that, let's go ahead and I want to control T and that will actually track the markers forward. Uh, there are also buttons down here if you don't want to do the hotkeys, but I always recommend you learn the hotkeys. And so now let's go back uh, to the frame that we started on, which was uh, 37 for me. So uh, now that we have this, we don't have any kind of thing uh, in the start of our footage. We started the trackers from the uh, kind of middle of the footage. And so what I want to do is control shift T and that'll actually track the markers backwards. And so now we have uh, these markers basically going throughout the entire length of our footage. So now that we have markers kind of in the middle of our footage, let's go ahead and do it from the exact start. So again, we're just going to detect some features and it saved our kind of values down here. So we don't have to change those again. Now that we're at the first frame, we can just hold control and press T and all those markers will track until the very end. And then finally, now that we have the start and middle i also like to do one uh, from the kind of end of the frame sequence and go all the way back so again detect features control shift t and that'll track all the markers to the beginning of the footage so now we basically have three sets of markers at the beginning middle and end of our footage and so now uh, we have all of this data you'll see these kind of blue lines right here and that's kind of the path uh, that the markers are going to take uh, it's kind of just a visual way to kind of tell the past and future of some of these markers if we actually bring this window up here uh, one thing i like to do this is kind of the graphing out of all the markers and uh, the one thing that we want to do is kind of start eliminating some of the bad markers and so if i come here let's select uh let's zoom in here i'm just going to select this green one that kind of like dips down a little bit uh, we want to try to select as many kind of outliers as possible so with that marker selected you'll see if i come up here this is the marker that we are talking about. And you'll see that the branch is moving itself. And this is very important. You only want to track things that are kind of stationary and uh, solid in your scene. So any people that are moving around, any branches or anything that's moving around is actually going to cause uh, some bad tracking. And so you can visually tell that from the graph down here. And so again, uh, since this branch is moving, we just want to go ahead and delete that. So with that selected right here, you can hit delete and delete tracks. And we want to do the same for all of the other kind of outliers of the graph down here so we have this one that's kind of doing its own thing we can go ahead and try to locate that that's actually uh, tracking to his head and again we don't want any tracking markers that are moving uh, around with the scene so i'm just going to go ahead and delete that i know some other kind of wonky ones down here um, i'm not going to view them all since we have so many tracking markers in our scene it's fine to just go ahead and delete some of the ones uh, you know that are a little bit wonky right there and so we have this kind of spike right here and uh, we have this kind of one here going a little bit haywire and that looks pretty good that looks uh pretty clean and you know i can see most of the markers actually following now so now once we've done a kind of uh, graph pass, we can bring this down and we want to go ahead and do kind of a visual pass up here. And so we're going to be looking up here uh, through all of our markers and kind of uh, look for ones that kind of jitter around or jump around or anything. So for example, I'll notice that there are some markers back here that kind of uh, follow these people walking in the background. You can see that it's like tracking onto them. Again, I don't want those since that's going to screw up our camera track. And I'll notice that there are some more ones kind of over here. It, this one gets tracked to him. And so you just want to kind of go uh, back around here. In testing, I've noticed a lot of the markers back here kind of track to the people. And so we don't, uh, we want to try to get rid of most of those as possible. And so this is where you kind of, um, you know, just need to zoom in and make sure they're not tracking to any per, uh, people. Uh, you don't have to get all of them out. Uh, we're going to be doing a thing in a little bit that's going to get, uh, you know, the all of them out. Um, but again, we do want to try to give uh, Blender the best possible scenario for the first camera track. Uh, so then we can work from there. And so now that we have that, that's gotten most of, them out, uh, most of them out. I'm sure there are a few that we missed, uh, like this bird up here um, that's flying. We can go ahead and delete some of those. But now that we have that, let's go ahead and get a camera solve. Now, a camera solve uh, with these you know, tracking markers as we have it now, they uh, are doing nothing. They are completely worth worthless. They're not going to give us a good camera track, uh, nothing. So what we actually have to do is tell Blender to take these points and actually try to calculate where the actual ground would be and where the points would be in 3D space. And so to do that, we're going to come over to the Solve tab. And uh, we have all of this information. 
super basic. Uh, the A and B keyframe is basically going to be the uh, kind of frame range where we get the most camera movement. And since this is a pretty like uh, you know solid, uh, smooth movement, it doesn't matter too much where we put it. It's actually the reason I chose this uh, you know shot is because yeah, you can't really go wrong here with the A and B keyframe. And so uh, in testing, I just did uh, frame one to sixty because uh, that's where we actually have the uh, you know kind of most amount of movement and that's just a nice little range to select um, you do want kind of a lot of parallax in your scene and what that means is that you want kind of uh, things in the foreground that we track so right here and then you also want things super in the uh, way in the background to track and that's actually because if you kind of check here you'll see that these lines of the trackers in the foreground are longer uh, than like some of the lines here in the background and that's actually because when we're when we have a moving camera things in the foreground move a lot more than things in the background and so blender is actually going to use all this position data uh, to tell that hey this uh, marker is moving in the background and it's not moving as much and so it must be this far away and so blender is going to work all of its magic uh, so let's just go ahead and uh, get a solve let's go ahead uh, again we already found our focal length so i'm not going to uh, put that we're going to uh, try to do our optical center and radio distortion we're going to refine that ourselves and then go ahead and solve the camera motion Okay, so once your camera track has finished, we have two new things that have popped into this window. First of all is the solve error. Now, that's actually not a physical error. You didn't do anything wrong, so don't worry about that. Uh, what it is, it's basically telling you how well the camera is actually tracked in the scene. And so basically, we want to try to get that number as low as we possibly can. A really good solve error is below a 0.1. I usually try to stick below 8.2 if I'm doing a more advanced scene where I need a uh, high accuracy. You can see by default we've gotten to 8.5, which is really nice. The other thing that's updated right here, it might be hard to see on YouTube, but there's actually a blue line in our graph now, and that's actually the solve error line. And so what you basically want to do is you want to view your uh, kind of solve error line throughout this cleanup process and make sure that it remains as flat as possible. You don't want any spikes anywhere because that might mean that uh, it has a very good track at the beginning of the footage, but then if it spikes up at the end and goes all haywire, then that means that it's actually losing some of the tracking at the end. And so you just want to make sure that's as uh, you know consistent as possible. Okay, so now let's actually clean up the tracks. What we're gonna do is we're gonna come over to the cleanup section. We're gonna clean the tracks. And then the reprojection error, all that is, is kind of the error of each specific marker. And so what I wanna do is basically take the worst markers and just select all of those and delete them and get those out of the scene. And then we can resolve the camera motion to get a lower average solve error. And so if I go ahead and click and then drag, you'll see that it starts to select uh, some of the higher reprojection errors of our tracking markers. So once you get a, uh, you know, good enough result that it's kind of skimming off, uh, you know, not that many, but again, um, you know, just kind of the ones that would visually be wrong in the scene. So let's go ahead and just delete that track. And then now that we have this, we need to go ahead and resolve the camera motion. And in theory, since we, uh, you know, deleted the bad tracks, we got a uh, lower solve error uh, overall. And so we just want to do that a couple more times. So again, clean tracks, push that reprojection error up and delete and then solve the camera motion again we are doing it bit by bit because if we did it everything from the start then i actually find that it deletes some potentially good tracking markers because of you know some of the data that it's using and so i like to go and just kind of skim off the top every single time and do that multiple times i just find that that leads to a better kind of solve error so let's again clean the tracks reprojection error up and this time i'll just do a little bit more so something like that delete all those and solve the camera motion again Okay, so I was able to get my solve error down to a 0.29, which is perfectly fine for this scene. Uh, so that's where I'm going to leave it at. If you are running into any problems where your solve error kind of jumps up, all you can do is just undo kind of your markers. That basically means that you've selected too many and it's actually deleting some of the good tracks. And so, um, you know, you can play around with it. Just get kind of a happy medium. Again, my line down here is perfectly straight. And so that is a good sign. Uh, you do want to make sure you have that. So now that we have that, we can go ahead and set up a 3D scene. So I want to bring this menu down here. Let's go ahead and right click. I want to join the areas and make uh, this a little bit bigger up here. Uh, so we can actually see our 3D scene. We're done with the graph, so we can go ahead and pull that down here. And so now what we want to do is we want to go ahead and scroll all the way down to this menu, set up background, and then set up the tracking scene. 
And so now uh, we have the background into our camera so we can actually see the footage. Uh, but also we have the tracking scene in here and then a bunch of dots. Now these dots are basically uh, the tracking markers and kind of where Blender has put the uh, markers in the 3D space. Uh, now one thing that we'll notice is that we have all of these uh, kind of points here uh, that are on the floor. And these are actually misaligned right now because Blender can't, uh, you know, automatically put that down. And so we need to basically tell Blender where the floor plane is so we can align that to our scene so that this cube is kind of resting on the floor. So let's come back to camera. Now I want to go ahead and set up the floor plane first, since that is the most important thing for camera tracking. Uh, now I'm going to set it up kind of where I want my object to be. I, I want the uh, kind of horse statue that I'm going to put. I want it to be around this area. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select kind of three points in this area. This one, this one, and this one uh, all are on the floor plane. Uh, so you just want to select kind of three points that uh, are going to be on the floor around where you're going to put your object. And then we're just going to go ahead and hit floor over here. And you can see that's automatically rotated our scene so that the cube and the kind of ground plane it created is automatically on our floor. Now uh, this scene is a little bit wonky since uh, the floor plane is a little bit uh, you know convoluted to uh, locate here so if for whatever reason your floor plane isn't aligned and everything's not tracking cor uh, correctly you just want to play around with some different floor points so like maybe this one uh, this one, this one, and this one. We can go ahead and try that one. So we're right there. So, uh, and again, that's just because the floor of the actual scene isn't perfectly level. It might be a little bit curved, um, but since we're not really going to mess around uh, too advanced with that, we're not going to, uh, you know, worry about that for now. So this is looking pretty good for me. What I want to go ahead and do is set up uh, the rotation of our scene and then go ahead and apply the correct scaling of our scene. So first, let's do the rotation since, that's, since that is super simple. I'm going to select this point to be my origin and then this point i am just going to select to be my x-axis so now uh, we just have the cube kind of rotated this way uh, next thing i want to do and probably the most important uh, thing in setting up your scene is to actually get the correct scale and this is to do with a multiple uh, multitude of reasons uh, motion blur might be affected if the scale is wrong uh, depth of field is probably the biggest because uh, if you want to put accurate you know, camera values like f-stops and all that, you do wanna make sure you have the correct scale of your scene. And so uh, in order to do the scale, we have this uh, kind of scaling section here. The distance is actually in meters. And so uh, whatever you wanna do, you wanna put uh, the you know correct uh, distance in there as meters. And so let's look for a set of points. So this one right here, uh, I would think that this one would be about a meter, uh, give or take. Uh, we just have to be kind of in a, uh, you know, margin of error for this. Since I did find this footage online, I didn't take measurements on the day. And so we're going to have to guesstimate a little bit here. Um, we could also, like, take a person's height and all that stuff. But, uh, you know, these look to be about a meter. So all I'm going to do is set the scale. And then depending on your scene, you can, of course, uh, change that scale. If you find two points and you think that's about two meters, you can plug that number in down here and it'll apply the scale up there. And so now we have uh, that scale applied. Now we can finally uh, come out of camera tracking and get into the 3D uh, kind of layout of our scene. So let's go to layout and then uh, let's come and save the project. And we want to go into camera view. Now, when Blender, we automatically set up the tracking scene and background. It set up a lot of stuff up here. Uh, the first thing and the most important thing that you have to do right out of uh, camera tracking is to actually uh, undistort the image because Blender in camera tracking kind of distorts the image and then sets that as our background. Uh, you can tell up here we had these like black kind of bars, uh, matte bars up here, and they were perfectly flat along the top and bottom. However, now they're kind of curved and they don't even go uh, to, the, to the entire edge anymore. And so that's actually because Blender is, you know, uh, trying to solve for the radial distortion and kind of the lens uh, distortion and all that. Uh, to change that, we're going to select the camera, go up to the data, background images, and we're going to come down to render undistorted and uncheck that. And now you can see our background image is back to the original view and nothing is going to be changed there. So that's very important. You do want to make sure that you have that in your scene. Okay, so next we need to go ahead and disable some of the stuff that Blender automatically set up. Let's delete the background uh, collection and also the foreground collection. You can keep those if you want, but it's going to get a little bit confusing uh, later on as we do this tutorial. 
Then also it created a background uh, kind of view layer. We don't need that as well. So I'm going to go ahead and delete that. And then finally in the compositing tab, it's created a bunch of nodes and you know, we're not going to have to deal with all this. This is a very confusing setup. Uh, so let's just make it super easy for this uh, beginner tutorial, delete those four nodes. And then finally, let's just get this movie clip and plug the image into the image of our alpha over. And now we have uh, a basic thing set up. We'll come to the compositing a little bit later. So you don't have to worry about this for now. So let's come back out to our layout tab. And you can see now we do want to check that our camera is tracked correctly. So if I actually select this cube, I want to G, Z, and then if I hold control and, uh, you know, move my mouse up, it'll actually snap to the floor. Uh, you do want to make sure whatever you do is on the floor plane of your scene. To do that, if you hit one on your numpad, you can kind of come over to the side view and you'll notice that the cube is resting on this red line, which is, you know, the ground plane of Blender. Again, uh, when camera tracking, it actually set up our floor plane to be that plane. And so if anything was kind of above this plane, it would act as it, if it's floating in the scene. So we don't want that. We want our statue to actually be on the ground. And so uh, whatever we do, we just want to make sure it's on that red line. So let's go back to camera view. Let's uh, click this plane and hide that by hitting H. And then I want the uh, statue to kind of be around here. So I'm going to G. G is to move. And then if I hit uh, Shift Z, that'll move on every axis besides the Z axis right there. So I want the uh, kind of statue to be over here. And what we are looking for as we play this is uh, that the cube is kind of following our scene. And, you know, there's not too much drift in here. Again, the floor is a little bit curved. And so there's a little bit of drifting here and there. Um, but again, since we're worrying about kind of the beginner side of things, I'm not going to go into ha how to actually, you know, get that to uh, match perfectly. And so now that we have all of that set up, we are actually ready to import in a uh, custom model that I downloaded from online. So let's go ahead and delete our uh, cube. And then we can unhide our ground plane up here by hitting that eyedropper. Okay, so now you want to go ahead and go in the description and download the model I have. I went ahead and just stuck with the 2K blend version of the file. So you just want to make sure when you're downloading that you download the right thing if you do want to follow along. Um, and then it'll provide you with the zip file. You just want to go ahead, right click, and then extract all. And then extract it to its own folder so we can actually see the blend file and everything here. Uh, and that's the nice thing about Polyhaven is it actually provides you with a Blender file. And so it's really high res. You know, I, I love Polyhaven for kind of, you know, testing shots like this. And so we don't need to open up this file yet. So let's uh, go ahead and minimize this. And a nice thing that we can actually use is uh, called appending. And appending will basically be like importing a file uh, that's already inside of a Blender project uh, from that Blender project into uh, this Blender project. And so it'll save all the materials, all the modeling, all the geometry details tell us everything and so it's just really kind of streamlined process uh, for uh, working within di bl uh, different blender files so it's super easy we're gonna come up here go to file append and locate that blend file in that folder that we just had okay so here is the blend file we can go ahead and double click inside of there and I want to locate the object folder and just double click inside of there and there's one singular object it's the horse statue 01 we want to go ahead and append that in and you can see that now we have the model actually inside of blender and everything is looking good let's go ahead and scale it up so i'm going to select the model here hit s to scale and i'm just going to scale that all the way up until we get kind of a uh you know good height that i want it to be we can go ahead and hide this again that's h and then I want to go ahead and rotate it so the horse is uh, facing more towards the camera. So select this. R is to rotate any object. And then I'm going to rotate it on the Z axis, which is the up and down axis. And I can just rotate my mouse until it's kind of facing a direction that I like. So right there is looking pretty cool. And now you can see that it's done most of the hard work for uh, for us. Thank you to the model modelers and textures and, you know, all of that. I'll have their names in the description below. So, um, you know, send thanks to them. I didn't do any of the work here. They did most of the heavy lifting for us but um, again we're going to be using this to composite now and make it look super realistic and then like it's actually in our scene and so let's go ahead and uh, see what we're actually going to be rendering and so a way to do that is if you hold down z it'll bring up this menu and we are in the solid view right now there's also the material preview uh, wireframe and then rendered right here of course we do want to go and see what our render is going to look like and uh, we have this you know beautiful result we will see uh, that we lost our background and that's actually because uh, Blender doesn't automatically come default with transparency. And so you got to enable that uh, super simple, come over here to render, 
down to film and we're going to turn on transparent. And so now uh, you'll see that we have a, a pretty nice result um, just with basic lighting, super basic. We don't have shadows. And then we also, uh, you know, it's not looking too realistic with the reflections. And so the first thing I want to talk about is the render engine. Over here in the render properties, you'll see that we have this render engine section. By default, it's set to EV, which is a great kind of real time, uh, you know, screen space renderer. However, the renderer we're going to be working in is cycles. And that's going to be the most realistic renderer inside of of default uh, blender you can of course use octane or some other uh, render engines uh, third-party render engines but i'm going to stick with uh, cycles if you do have a gpu you want to make sure you set the device to gpu compute since it's going to be much faster to render and kind of preview like that also, if you want to come up here to edit preferences and all the way down to system right here, uh, if you do have a RTX card, you can uh, select this optics and then select your card right here. And this will help render out the scene blazing fast. Um, honestly, if you are looking to build a machine for Blender specifically, I highly recommend you guys stay with NVIDIA GPUs. They are just unmatched right now inside of Blender and uh, hopefully AMD will catch up here soon. Anyways, let's go ahead and exit out of here, and you can see that we have all of this set up. Uh, we do have a kind of like default light in our scene that I never deleted. Uh, you can use that if you want. It's giving me too harsh of highlights, so I'm just going to go ahead and delete that. Also, let's uh, unhide our ground plane so we can see this back, and you can see that it's here, and it's basically set up to be a shadow catcher object. And this is something that Blender automatically set up when we were, uh, you know, setting up a tracking scene. Uh, like we did before and so all uh, we can do to kind of view what it's doing is come over to the object properties all the way down to visibility and right here you can see it set it to be a mask shadow catcher and so if i turn that off you can see it turns that off but uh, we do want to leave that on for now since we're actually going to be using a shadow catcher object like that Okay, so now we have the model in our scene, and we also have uh, kind of our basic uh, scene camera tracked, and now we're actually ready to light and shade our scene and get into the compositing of everything. So I'm going to keep it super simple for this tutorial. I'm going to go ahead and use a HDR image, and all that is is basically an image with multiple kind of exposure ranges uh, that basically has lighting data baked into it. And so in order to enable that, you want to go ahead and download the image I have linked down below. Again, Polyhaven is a great resource for that. Uh, so once you have that downloaded, we can come to the world properties. We want to go all the way up and uh, select this kind of yellow circle right here beside the color. Once we have that selected, we can go to environment texture. We want to select that. And then we can go ahead and, of course, open the image. And here is our HDR image. We just want to select that and open the image. And now you can see we have a lot of lighting in our scene. And it's looking much, much better than we uh, the default lighting inside Blender. And unfortunately, it is that time to go ahead and talk about color space again. Now, if you remember when we were camera tracking and also uh, rendering it out as a image sequence, we changed the color view transform into standard. And again, that's the best for videos and image sequences. However, it's not the best for rendering out of cycles. And so what we want to do is we want to come up here to the render properties, go down to color management again. Again, it's on standard since we set that before. We want to set it from standard uh, to AGX. Now, AGX is kind of the new standard inside of Blender. It is actually a new feature inside of Blender uh, 4.0, and so that's the correct kind of color space for actually rendering out CG objects. So if I actually come up here to the camera settings and then go to the background images, I can change the opacity all the way up just so I can demonstrate a point. So now you'll see that our background kind of image is super dull looking. It's lost all of its saturation and vibrance and all that. And that's actually because, again, it is using that AGX color space transform to actually apply it to everything in the scene. And so that presents a problem because now we have our CGI, which works best in the AGX view transform. And then we have our background footage which works best in the standard transform and now on standard if i look at my cgi everything is washed out all white and we're losing a ton of color data and so we don't want that at all we want to have as much data as possible for actually compositing it and to make it look realistic and so a way to get around this is we're basically going to render out just the horse and the shadow uh, with transparency and render those out as kind of their own individual passes and then we're going to take it into a new blender project and then using the standard view transform that's where we can actually go back and composite everything together in the correct view transform i know that was a lot of information but i'll try to explain it as 
as we go since it's not really that difficult. So first thing we want to do is render out the uh, horse pass. So let's go ahead and go to view transform AGX. And you can see we have a lot more data right now. Uh, that it's not blowing out as much now. You will notice that the shadow is going in the wrong direction. If I kind of go to the end of the footage, uh, we can see these bicyclists. Their shadow is basically going down into the right. And so we want to mimic that direction as much as possible. In order to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and come up here until we see kind of this uh, thing on my cursor. We want to click and drag a new window out here. And so uh, we have a duplicate of our 3D uh, kind of view layer right here. We want to go ahead and select this menu up here, go to the shader editor. And now if I hit in, we can hide that panel over here. And now we have, uh, you know, basically where you can mess around with material nodes and all of that stuff. That's where you get really complicated into Blender. Uh, the nice thing about our object, if I select that, is that the nodes and everything were automatically set up by the creators. And so we don't have to touch any of that. What I do want to go ahead and play around with is if I select instead of object, I want to go into the world tab. And this is actually the nodes for uh, the kind of world shading. Again, since we did set up a HRI, we can see that we have this uh, image node plugged into our background. And so that's basically how the HRI works is that it's using this image to influence the background of our scene, which is giving us lighting. And so what we want to do is we want to go ahead and tell the, uh, you know, image to rot rotate itself so that the shadow is facing this way. Now, what we do need to do is go ahead and uh, enable a add-on that comes free with Blender. So come up here to Edit, Preferences, down to Add-ons. And then if you type in Node, N-O-D-E, uh, we can see this Node Wrangler add-on pops up. It should be unchecked for you, but you do want to make sure that it, uh, you have it checked. It's a very good node inside of Blender, one of my favorites. So uh, once you have that, we can go ahead and save Preferences down there. And then exit out of that. And with that node installed, what we can go and do is con uh, with this kind of image selected, we can hold Control and T. And what that has done is added a texture coordinate and mapping node. And uh, both of those are, you know, kind of nodes that you use a lot for, uh, you know, materials and all that without getting too complicated and everything. All we're going to use this for is to rotate our image. And so we have all this kind of vector data here. Um, we're going to go ahead and with the Z rotation, again, Z is kind of the up and down axis. We're just going to set that and rotate that if we click and drag. And you can see our light is now moving around in our scene. And so that is giving us the exact result that we are looking for. You can see that our uh, we basically try to want to match the direction of the shadow over here. So maybe it's a little bit kind of back like that. And so now the kind of sun is exactly where the sun would be in the actual real world environment. And so let's go ahead and save the project there. Uh, what I will notice if I bring this menu over here is that we're having some of the shadow cut off here. And that's actually because our shadow uh, ground layer isn't big enough. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is just uh, kind of uh, S and scale that all the way up just so our shadow runs the entire length that it needs to. And so now this is looking super, super realistic um, and, you know, giving us a really good result. So let's go ahead. I want to position this a little bit better. So G, Shift Z again. I'm just going to position that right there uh, just so it's, you know, rule of thirds, all that composition uh, mumbo jumbo that you'll learn throughout your artistry. Now let's go ahead and uh, get a first render out. So I'm going to come up here and render the image. Okay, so now you can see what I'm talking about of uh, we want to actually get a alpha background with our horse. You can see that we basically don't have our footage in here anymore. Uh, it's going to continue to render and then, you know, combine that. It is taking a super long time to render, so I'm going to go ahead and mess around with some of the render properties now. So let's X out of here, just stop that render and come to solid view. What I do want to do is let's go uh, up to... The render settings, uh, the sample count is basically how noisy uh, uh, the image is going to be. This is the main thing that affects your render time. Uh, we'll change around some of these values in the future. I want to denoise the viewport because uh, that'll actually let us kind of view it uh, without all of the noise applied. So here's it before. You can see it's very grainy. And then if we denoise it, it just gets rid of the grain uh, for viewing purposes only. I'm going to change the max samples down to a 64 so it's a little bit less taxing on our uh, hardware then I don't want to uh, denoise the render and I want to turn this down to like a 128 for now we're of course going to change this at the very end to get the highest quality possible but since we're still in the creative stage I don't want to really worry about super long renders right now 
And so uh, let's now go ahead and come to the compositing section. And we can, uh, if you hold shift, control, and then click, you can see uh, the node selected. If I hit V on my keyboard, it'll actually zoom that out so we can see that node. And what this is basically doing is it's taking our kind of horse render layer and it's uh, combining it over top of our kind of background render layer. Again, uh, you can see the image is super washed out, uh, but our horse is looking very nice. And so what we want to do is we basically want to render out multiple passes out, uh, out of Blender in this project and then take it into another project to composite. And so what I want to do, if I kind of bring this out here, I want to separate the horse from the actual shadow because I want to uh, basically play around with some of the compositing and have uh, you know that flexibility and compositing to mess around with them separately so what i'm going to do is uh to actually separate them let's come back out to the layout tab and let's come to uh, the solid view for now and what i can go ahead and do is i want to create uh, two new collections so i'm going to right click new collection right click new collection i'm going to name this first collection the horse collection and of course the second one i'm just going to name shadow I want to place the ground object into our shadow collection and then the horse statue object into my horse collection. So now we have the two different collections and if I toggle them on and off, you can see that it's toggled uh, the you know respective objects on and off. And so now that we have that control, we also need to control the different view layers. Because right now, if we were to render this out, it's only going to render out this foreground view layer. If I come back out to compositing, you'll see it's set to be our foreground uh, view layer. So we actually need to have two view layers to basically render out the horse in one and then the shadow in the other. So let's come back out to layout. I want to go ahead and name this uh, foreground one. I'm just going to name horse. And then let's create a new uh, view layer. I'm going to name this one, of course, shadow. And so in these, you know, right layers, we need to enable and disable uh, the correct things. And so uh, for the shadow, we're in the shadow view layer right now. What I want to do is set the horse to basically affect all of the shadows, but not actually be uh, seen by the camera. And then I want to do the vice versa for the actual horse uh, layer. And so what I'm going to do is if I come up here and select this menu, it uh, basically gives us a lot of the toggles that we can use for the different collections. So the one I'm looking for here is set to indirect only. So if I select that, you'll see that we now have an extra kind of toggle uh, option over here. And if I go ahead and toggle that on for my horse collection, we can see what it's doing. It's basically telling uh, Blender that for this specific view layer, the shadow view layer, we want everything in the horse collection to not be seen, but to affect everything else indirectly. And so indirect stuff includes like shadows, um, it includes reflections, all of that uh, nice, uh, you know, ambient occlusion, all of that stuff. And so uh, basically all that's giving us is the exact result that we want is just the shadow in this later. And so now we can go into our horse view layer and we want to do the opposite. We want the shadow to be indirect now. And so now we don't have shadow on the ground and we have our horse object right there. So now if I uh, save the project, let's go up to compositing and we can still see that uh, we this render layers node is just the horse one. If I go ahead and shift D, duplicate that down, I want to select this one to instead of horse, I want this one to be shadow. So now we have two render layers nodes and that's gonna basically split up the two different passes of our image. And so now let's go ahead and render out another image. Okay, so now that that is done rendering, we can X out of here, and now we can see what uh, we have accomplished. So if I uh, kind of view this again, that shift control and clicking, we can see that we just have our horse with the transparent background, and then now we have our shadow in its own uh, kind of pass and view layer in of itself, and we can use those to kind of composite them separately. And so that is exactly what we want. Now we are actually ready to go ahead and render out the final passes uh, for our shot and, you know, get them ready to actually composite. Now, in the old days, we would actually have to go ahead and render out the individual passes all the way through uh, manually and individually. So I would have to render out the entire horse pass, uh, stop the render at the very end, and then render out the entire shadow pass and change all the settings there. Uh, Blender has come a long way, and it's actually introduced a new node that allows us to do it both at the same time. And so let's go ahead and use that node. It is uh, if I shift A, add a file output node right here. Uh, this is the node that basically allows us to take whatever uh, sockets are in here and render them out all at the same time and saves us a lot of manual labor and, uh, you know, render time in the, uh, in the future. And so let's go ahead and uh, you, you'll notice that it has a image socket and then also this uh, kind of base path. 
Uh, the settings are a little bit hidden inside of Blender, so if I, you select this and go up to Node, uh, and then Properties, these are all the settings of the node. I don't know why it's kind of hidden in there. Uh, I don't really like that layout. Uh, but basically all this node is, is if we add a new input, we can add as many inputs as we want. Uh, again, since we're only running two passes, we don't need kind of those other ones, so I'm going to go ahead and just delete those, work with uh, these image sockets. Um, and this is basically just a replacement of the composite section and also the output properties and stuff like that. So for this method, you won't have to worry about any of the output properties like we did before. And so now let's just select that file output node again. I want my first pass to be named horse. And then my second pass, I want to be named shadow. And so uh, to actually go ahead and render this out, let's plug the correct images into the horse and shadow. And what I'm going to do, you could also render this as a EXR kind of multi-layer file, which is just one singular file. Um, however, I'm going to render them out as kind of image sequences um, in of itself, PNG sequences. Um, so it'll make sense once I kind of show you uh, how it's done. And so uh, you want to go ahead and, of course, name uh, where you want the files to be saved. Uh, so you want to locate that, name um, that, whatever. Uh, you don't want to name the actual files in there because what's going to happen is when we render out the files, it's going to take the name of this uh, for each of the respective files. So basically we'll have one folder with two separate passes, two separate image sequences uh, inside of the same folder. And so one image sequence is going to be named horse and the other one is going to be named shadow. And so, uh, of course, set all your uh, file formats here. We do want RGBA this time, since we do want that alpha channel, like I said before. Compression, we can just leave at uh, 15%. Uh, all of these settings are fine for what I'm going to use it for. If you do want higher quality, you can maybe render it out, um, you know, at a EXR, which is kind of the industry standard at this point. Uh, one very important no and kind of a bug inside of Blender is that for the file output node, you do need to have the composite node still uh, within Blender. What that's basically going to do is just it'll send a composite um, out to your output settings. So uh, by default, it's set, sent to your temporary file location on your computer. And so um, it's just very weird. I guess it's a bug inside of Blender. And so you just want to make sure you have it. You can even unplug it and make it black if you want uh, but I'm just gonna plug that in there and so now we have pretty much everything set up again you do want to set the base path you don't want it to go to your temporary file location um, so now that we have set that set up let's go ahead and you know um, render out an image just to see what that's doing Okay, so once your render is finished, you do want to locate wherever you save that file. Uh, here's just like a little test folder I made. And you can see that we have these two separate uh, versions uh, of the different passes. So we have the horse, of course, uh, that's going to be whatever you name it, plus our frame range. So horse, um, this is frame 26. And then, of course, we have the opposite pass. We have the shadow frame 26. So those are going to be saved in their own folder. And so let's just kind of view these different passes you can see here. What I will notice is our horse is super, super grainy. And so I want to try to get that out as much as possible um, to, you know, make it look uh, more natural. The shadow, I don't believe, is as grainy. So we're just going to leave the shadow as is. So I'm going to come out of here. I do want to denoise the horse kind of pass. And the nice thing about how we have it set up is basically we can, you know, have all the nodes uh, that we want. And as long as, you know, the final node is plugged into the credit path here uh, that's actually going to give us the uh, correct you know multi-pass rendering inside of blender so let's go ahead and denoise this uh, i could come over here to uh you know the render properties and use this denoise uh button but i don't really like doing that i like to work uh, with a denoise node inside blender so i'm going to come over here to the view layer properties and I'm going to enable denoising data. And you can see here uh, that's enabled some more denoising data for the correct uh, render layer. And since I was in the horse render layer, it went ahead and added, uh, added it just to the horse, not to the actual shadow right here. So if I shift A, I'm going to add a denoise node, plug that into this kind of uh, file stream. And then if I plug the normal into the normal and then the albedo into the albedo, once we render it out, it's going to take the denoise version of that and send that into our horse uh, pass instead. 
So now with all of that set up, we are pretty much ready to go ahead and render out our uh, multi-pass render. Before I do that, I do want to make one point, and that is to actually come back out to the layout tab. And if we are in the horse section over here, it doesn't matter too, too much for this scene. But if you do have a uh, object that has a lot more reflections in it, uh, we will actually kind of get the bounce lighting of uh, whatever material we have for our ground. So if I actually disable the indirect and then go ahead and object properties down to shadow catcher turn that off you notice the default material is white and so if uh, there was a huge uh, you know reflection you can actually see a little bit of the reflection over here uh, it's basically going to take the sunlight and reflect it uh, the light is going to hit the uh, material here and bounce some of that color onto here and so what i want to do is i want to go ahead and make the material of this ground match the material of the ground in the real world again not too big of a deal for this scene since uh there's not a lot of reflections but if you are dealing like with uh you know metallic things then you'll definitely be able to see uh some white highlights that you want to try to get out of and so let's come over here go up into object properties and i'm going to add a new material I'm going to just name this ground for now. And it's set up a principal BSDF by default. Let's go ahead and add a image texture. And then I'm going to go ahead and open up our image sequence. Okay, so again, here is our background image sequence. I'm going to hit A to select everything, open image. And you can see it's a... Uh, imported in the correct number of frames and the start frame it's not going to auto refresh uh, you actually do need to go ahead and press this button and that'll basically uh, make it you refresh to the current frame instead of just being a single kind of still image and so let's plug that into the color of our principal bsdf and you can see it's totally black and that's actually because we aren't projecting it on the uh you know object at all we actually need to go again and add uh, some vector data into our scene and so let's uh, select this image socket we're gonna again control t to add a texture coordinate and mapping node again this is what you use a lot of times inside of uh you know materials so uh, if you are interested in that you better get used to kind of this workflow and so with the texture coordinate it's automatically set to the uv uh, and not to get any like into any technical stuff or anything but we don't want it to be the uv of our object we want it to be instead uh, our window so if I plug window into vector, it's basically going to take our window that we're viewing it from. And since we're viewing it from our camera, it's going to project whatever image uh, we have over here to the object from our camera view. And so that is really nice. You can see, though, it's creating a little bit of a problem outside of our camera. And so let's fix that. I'm going to come over here. Instead of repeat, we're going to set it to be mirror. And now it's a little bit better. Um, so we'd get more accurate kind of tiling uh, outside of our camera view. Uh, you will notice it's not matching our background. If I actually come up here and change the outline selected off, you'll notice that there is a huge seam right here. So we want to try to get that out as, mo uh, as closely as possible. What I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the roughness all the way over here and then go to the specular and decrease that all the way over here. And that just kind of removes some of the uh, light values of our scene and making the object not as reflective as the actual ground would be. So now let's bring both of these nodes over here and I want to go ahead and shift a, I'm going to add a gamma node and a gamma node is just going to, um, you know, dark, darken this a little bit to try to match it to the light levels over here. And so let's zoom in a little bit. I'm just going to increase the gamma, uh, 1.4 looks perfectly fine. Again, uh, since this is a shadow catcher, we're not going to be seeing it as much. So it doesn't matter uh, too much, but you know, that matches pretty closely over there. So now that we have the material set up, let's go ahead and outline select back on uh, now that we have our material set up correctly and it's gonna you know provide us correct bounce sliding we do need to go ahead and set it to be a shadow catcher again uh, so let's come over here make, make uh, in the object properties make the mask a shadow catcher and then also uh, for the horse layer we need to go ahead and set this back to indirect only again uh, since we just set up the materials and everything uh, the bounce light and the reflections here are much more accurate it's a very small detail but one that matters a lot more if you are dealing with the highly reflective objects inside of uh, blender so now with all of that set up we are finally ready to render out to uh, a new file inside of blender so again here Here's the setup that we are running for uh, rendering out multi-pass files. Uh, both of our render layers, uh, we're denoising the horse layer, and both of those are being sent into our file output node, which I have going to its own folder that we are going to separate later. And so with all of that set up now, we can go ahead and render the animation. Okay, so once your render has finished, we are actually ready to open a new project and go ahead and composite. So I want to come up here to File, New, General. 
and then we can go up to the compositing section we're going to hit use nodes uh, since we're not rendering anything in the layout section we can go ahead and delete this and then we just need to go ahead and shift a add a image node and we need to import in our different passes so the first one i want to import in is our uh, video sequence so again here's our image sequence i'm going to hit a open image and now we have that it's automatically set to auto refresh so we don't have to worry about that let's go ahead shift d duplicate that down next we want our horse sequence so let's open that up okay so now you can see this i want to select the first uh, kind of frame of our horse so horse 01 for me Let's scroll all the way down until we get the very last frame, but before our shadow, we don't want to select the shadow yet. So I'm going to hold shift and then uh, click, and that has selected basically uh, the entire frame range of our just horse, uh, you know, PNG sequence. Let's open that image now. And again, uh, 87 frames, you do want to check that, auto refresh. Finally, let's uh, shift D, duplicate that. Let's open up a new file. And then of course, we just want to do the opposite and select our shadow uh, first, frame and then uh, shift control click uh, the last frame and open the image so now we have all of our different passes in again if you hold uh, shift control and click we can add a viewer load and then v to uh, kind of zoom that out and now comes the uh, amazing part where we have everything finally in the correct color transform. And this is very important inside of Blender because if you do not, you're going to be messing up the colors uh, with, within your, you know, compositing and everything. So now it's looking super dull. And again, that's because Blender automatically comes with the filmic uh, color transform. So we need to finally go up to render properties, down to color management and set it from filmic into standard. And finally, everything is the correct color and we can finally composite everything as we would uh, elsewhere in another program like nuke or after effects or you know whatever there and so finally let's go ahead and combine some stuff let's uh, shift a I'm gonna add a alpha over node because again that's how we combine different layers inside of blender if you think of it like a video editing tab it's basically putting a uh, you know layer on top of another layer and so let's uh, take this image of our horse. I'm going to plug it in the bottom socket and then the image of our background clip into the top socket and then shift control click that. And now we can see that we have the two things kind of on top of each other. If we kind of scrub down here, you can see that our horse is moving along to the background and everything is looking nice. If I do uh, kind of alt V zoom in there, you will see that there's like this white line going around our horse. And without getting uh, too into the technicals, it's basically uh, because our alpha channel right here uh, if we click that this is our alpha channel and it's not being applied to our image yet um, and so that's where this kind of convert pre multiply button comes in if we just press that that'll basically get out the white line um, i'm not going to go too much into that since that gets a little bit into the technical stuff but just know if you do see that white line just to click the convert pre multiply button so now we have our horse on top of our footage but we have lost our shadow and so in order to get that back, let's go ahead and instead of like, you know, normally uh, in, you know, render or layer software is what you would do is you would, you know, add another layer kind of maybe here and then you would plug your shadow in here and then maybe your horse in here and then that would go into uh, you know, the final alpha over. And so now we have the shadow back in and all that stuff. Uh, I'm actually not going to do it like that. And that's actually the kind of wrong method. If you care about uh, color accuracy and all that stuff, what I actually want to do is I want to take the alpha of uh, our shadow and actually use that to influence the actual pixel data of my plate. And so that's going to give us much more uh, control of kind of the values of the shadow and try to match that more closely to uh, kind of the shadows we see in the background. And so let's, again, I'm just going to plug the image into the alpha over of our uh, background image. And let's go and delete the alpha over. That was just for demonstration purposes. So now we have it uh, back to the original thing. So like this, uh, what I want to go and do is I want to add uh, a, a node to color correct our footage right here. So that my node that I like to do for that is uh, shift A. I'm going to add a color balance node. So like that click that and place that in the stream going into our alpha. And so if I kind of play around with uh, some of the values here, you, you'll see that it's color correcting our background footage, uh, but it's color correcting the entire thing. And so that's where this factor section comes in. Uh, I have this alpha kind of mat that came, uh, you know, with the PNG sequence of our alpha of the shadow. So I want to plug that alpha into the factor of our color balance. And now if I view that, it's basically telling, uh, you know, Blender that for this color balance node, I only want to affect the alpha of, uh, you know, where the shadow would be. 
And so let's go ahead and select this and backspace to undo everything. Uh, I like working in the uh, offset power slope, so I'm going to select that. And then uh, over here, we want to try to match the shadow to the background shadow as much as possible. So maybe I'm going to decrease some of these and decrease some of the slope. Uh, now you can just play around with it or follow along with me. Uh, so that's kind of roughly around the same uh, value of that. If you do want to kind of match it a little bit more, uh, maybe you can go ahead and add a blur node after our color. And then uh, we'll set it to fast Gaussian and maybe do it to a three. Um, and so now you can see uh, we actually need to uh, undo that. We need to set that to our alpha instead of our actual image. So let's bring that here. And now it's only blurring the alpha. And so if I go ahead and uh, M to mute that, we can see if I, we uh, kind of zoom into the shadow here, we can see if I mute and unmute that, it's basically making the shadow a little bit softer. So of course you can play around with it for your scene. I, I believe for my final composite, I didn't have it in, so I'm just gonna plug the alpha into the factor like that. What I do notice is that all the shadows back here are very blue, uh, whereas mine is very like black looking. And so that's where we can come inside of the uh, offset power slope and mess around a little bit with kind of the hue here. So I might add some of the blue selection um, in the slope and then might play around with some of the values in the uh, power section. Just to tint it a little bit bluer, you can of course play around with that, but that's looking much, much more accurate. And that is uh, the exact reason why we do the color balance node instead of uh, combining it with the PNG um, shadow sequence, uh, just because we can have that kind of uh, ability to play around with the pixel data instead of the ra uh, la layers data. Okay, so finally with all of this setup, you can uh, have a lot of fun inside of compositing, play around with that. Um, I think our black values and white values match pretty well to our scene, so I'm not really going to be showing you how to match those, but uh, with high level uh, high level compositing, that is something that you want to match is uh, make sure the blackest thing in here matches the blackest uh, pixel in your footage. And so finally, now that we have all of that set up, we can go ahead and I want to put the image into the composite uh, because if I didn't, nothing would actually render out. Let's uh, set the end frame to be 87, if you remember. And this is where we're actually going to render out as a movie sequence. Uh, so let's come down to the output properties. Of course, I'm going to change the file format into an FFmpeg video. And then encoding, I'm going to go ahead and set it to be a QuickTime. And then for me, I'm just going to stick on H.264 high quality. Of course, this is where uh, whatever you're doing, you can uh, format it to however you want. Since I'm uh, doing this straight to YouTube, this is kind of the workflow that I like to use uh, for me. Once you have that set up, we, of course, have to set a new file location. Uh, this is where you want the final render to actually go. Once you are confident with all of your settings over here, uh, you do want to pick your frame rate. Um, I believe the base footage is 24, so I'm going to keep it as a 24 uh, you know, frame rate. Uh, but, of course, since it is independent of frame rates because we have rendered it out as a image sequence, you can, uh, can, of course, change it to 60 if you wanted. It'd just look a little bit sped up if you did that. Uh, but again, I'm just going to leave it 24. And finally, the last thing we have to do is go ahead and render and render the animation. Okay, so here is the final result that we got from this tutorial. Hopefully you guys got something similar and learned some things on the way. Again, this is the basic workflow for like 90% of the uh, CG integration shots that you do inside of Blender. For my own workflow, I usually camera track in a separate software called SynthEyes, and then I bring that camera track inside of Blender, and then Blender is where I render out the CG and lighting and all uh, do all that stuff, and then I actually take my compositing inside of Nuke uh, to do that, and so that's where you can uh, try to work in your own workflow, and you know, you don't have to use Blender for everything. I actually recommend you guys try to stick uh, to, you know, only doing specific things inside of Blender uh, just because you'll find that your artwork is much better in the long run. Anyways, if you made it this far in the video, I'd greatly appreciate it if you consider liking and subscribing as it would greatly help out the channel with the YouTube algorithm. But anyways, I hope you enjoyed and I will see you in the next one.